According to the UN, there are about 243 million drug users worldwide. One in 200 are considered problem drug users. The most persistent message from drug lobbyists is that the war on drugs has failed and that historic attempts at prohibition were a disaster. This message dominates nearly every discussion, media release and article. It leaves an impression in the public's mind that governments have always been fighting a long, costly but losing war against illicit drugs and any attempts at prohibition only lead to locking up more users and increases crime. Hollywood adds to the narrative with films like Bonnie and Clyde, Public Enemy, Road to Perdition, Lawless and many others. But what specific wars are being referred to and was the prohibition really responsible for mafia dons like Al Capone? Someone once wrote that it takes six truths to overtake one lie and as with this history we'll find that it's far more complex and will highlight periods when the drug trade was on, not only perfectly legal but a massive source of government revenue. In the late 1600s, smoking opium in China was very common. Other countries joined in the lucrative trade, including French, Portuguese, the British, as they competed to gain control of the opium trade. Apart from the devastating health effects, this nation experienced a reduction in business activity, a fall in living standards and the virtual standstill of its civil service. Minister Lin calculated that in 1839, Chinese opium smokers consumed 100 million teals worth of the drug, while the entire spending of the government came to 400 million teals. This prompted him to appeal to Queen Victoria to stop the trade. Chinese officials went on to confiscate more than 1,000 tonnes of the drug then openly burned opium in a beach and shut down all trade and demanded foreign merchants leave. This became the pretext to the first opium war. During what was referred to as a century of humiliation from 1839 and then ending in 1860 against both the British-French alliance, this era ended with the Chinese government legalising opium trade and the 99-year lease of Hong Kong to the British. In 1906, China, once again gripped by the ravages of opium addiction, issued a declaration. It said that it wanted to limit the cultivation of opium and opium smoking to be abandoned within 10 years. But the edict ran into many problems. First, the Chinese government officials, 90% of whom were confirmed opium smokers and about 50% had a vested interest in the continuing trade. And then, of course, the British. They had fought two costly wars and they weren't about to suffer another full-scale economic loss. Paraphrasing one person's observations, it was the triumph of the law of business over that of human affairs. The old central system was now in decline. By 1911, the imperial empire was dead and the Chinese Republic was born. After decades of senseless war and destruction, opium trading had made some nations exceedingly rich while incapacitating another ancient one. The law of unintended consequences would come full circle to unleash its horrors of drug abuse in the West. In a twist of historical irony, the introduction of opium into the US began with the Chinese immigrating to find workers mining and railroad labourers. By the mid-1800s, the nefarious opium dens once found everywhere in China were now a feature of the US social landscape. The key point here is the striking similarity with the earlier Chinese trade and prohibition attempts that are now mirrored in early America. Expanding and profitable trade becomes the focus that rationalises the incapacitating health effects and community destruction on the American Indians. But opium use was also spreading quickly. States such as California and San Francisco could easily access the drug, and now it was spreading east into New York, Chicago, St. Louis, and New Orleans. Attempts to limit opium use began in 1878 to close opium dens. But it was the Civil War that put an end to all these prohibition attempts. Opium and alcohol were used widely due to the scale and injury of the war. Medical procedures on broken bones and severe flesh wounds mostly involved amputation. The sheer scale of the war meant an estimated one in four families lost a family member and the prescribed medication to relieve the emotional pain for grieving relatives was once again opium.
The following slide gives an indication of the amounts that were distributed. The end of the Civil War and the close of the 19th century witnessed rampant substance abuse. Yet even as some raised the alarm about addiction, often the solution was substituting one drug for another. Health and societal concerns were being outweighed with weightier government concerns. Rumours of war quickly escalated, culminating in the First World War of 1914. During this period, there were growing calls for national alcohol prohibition to be implemented as a war measure. But prohibition would not gain momentum until the close of World War I in 1918. By 1915, addiction was rampant amongst immigrants, sex workers, veterans, but also middle-class housewives and physicians themselves. The profile of a typical opium addict was a 19th century middle-aged Caucasian woman that was married with children and financially stable. Products containing opium were sold by pharmacies as well as shoemakers, tailors and grocery stores. Laudanum, the mixture of alcohol and opium, was taken commonly to relieve colds, diarrhoea, coughs, menopause, tuberculosis, and of course to facilitate amputations. It was only a short step from using opium as medicine to treat cholera and dysentery to using it for recreation. As a result, the habit of opium use spread quickly. The Industrial Revolution was rapidly changing the production landscape. Alcohol and drugs were beginning to be seen as not compatible with mechanisation. As most work involved operating machinery, large-scale mining, industrial logging and railroad engines. These required precision, concentration and punctuality. Alcohol alone was estimated to cause about 35,000 deaths per year. But once again, not unlike the British opium trade, the human cost took a backseat to the taxes derived from alcohol and opium that were a boon for government revenue. Up until the income tax assessment, as much as 40% of federal revenue came from alcohol tax alone. The prohibition threatened to bring down the government bureaucratic system, costing the federal government $11 billion in tax revenue. In spite of this, prohibition was voted through. But it's unsurprising that it soon became quite apparent that many law enforcement and government bureaucrats would find any means to secure their paychecks. What isn't explained is that well before 1919, organised crime existed in Chicago for well over a century, beginning roughly in the 1850s. As one author put it, organised crime always seeks to commercialise and exploit human nature. The most common markets were prostitution, newswire and gambling. Gangsters all belonged to powerful groups of organised criminals and already had significant influence on the government and police forces in Chicago. This is a key point. Without the already existing corruption of law enforcement, criminal gangs would never have acquired the capital to exponentially grow their operations and continue to bribe a wide range of public servants during and after the prohibition. News of prohibition simply meant that they were able to upscale their existing business models and networked amongst each other that included their government contacts in a way that was not seen previously vast amounts of money that went with these operations fostered even greater rampant public service corruption. One of the major bootleggers was George Remus. He had around a thousand salespeople on his payroll. Many of them were law enforcement and included politicians, prohibition agents, federal marshals, up to the highest levels of government including US Attorney General Harry Doherty. He was found guilty of selling alcohol illegally, pardoning offenders and taking bribes from bootleggers. Remus estimated that half his takings went towards bribes. It comes as no surprise then that Al Capone's infamous Chicago organisation reportedly made 60 million in 1927 and had half the city's police on its payroll. In 1933, prohibition comes to an end after 13 years. But in recent decades, some academics and researchers have re-examined prohibition history and acknowledged that some of its successes have often gone unrecognised. During that period, there was a growing awareness of the dangers of alcoholism and drug abuse to societal, mental and physical health. The prohibition movements, at the very least, made government acknowledge the seriousness of the issues surrounding addiction and took steps to limit public access to alcohol and drugs.
The death rate from alcoholism was cut by 80% in 1921 from pre-war levels. Death from cirrhosis of the liver in men fell from 29.5% per 100,000 in 1911 to 10.7% per 100,000 in 1929. The US didn't get back to pre-prohibition drinking levels until the late 1930s, which coincided with the Great Depression, and really didn't surpass the most drunken periods in American history until the 1970s. But since that time, governments have continued to have a troubled relationship with drugs, their domestic and foreign policy often at a clash. Not unlike the corrupt law officials during the Prohibition era that partnered with organised crime, today multiple investigations and testimonies have uncovered credible and troubling accounts of governments across the world that have partnered with drug cartels for various political purposes, including geopolitical warfare and narco-terrorism, such as Al-Qaeda, which funds its activities via Afghanistan's opium harvest, valued at 3.1 billion US dollars in 2006. In 1988, Senator John Kerry acknowledged this nexus in a speech addressing the Subcommittee on Narcotics, Terrorism and International Operations. And I quote, From what we have learnt these past months, our declaration on war against drugs seems to have produced a war of words and not action. Our borders are inundated with more narcotics than in any other time before. It seems as though stopping drug trafficking in the United States has been a secondary US foreign policy objective, sacrificed repeatedly for other political and institutional goals, such as changing government of Nicaragua, supporting the government of Panama, using drug running organizations as intelligence assets, and protecting military and intelligence sources from possible compromise through involvement in drug trafficking. Ironically, Senator Kerry went on to later serve under President Obama, whose administration was implicated after a major year-long investigation reported the US departments secretly worked with Mexican drug lords. But the US is facing not only enemies from within, but without. Dr. Joseph Douglas is a national security analyst with an expertise in defence policy, including international narcotics and trafficking. His book, Red Cocaine, documents the Russian communist efforts to flood the West with illicit drugs as a form of covert warfare. Could this also be the aims of drug lobbyists who acknowledge the end game of total drug liberalisation? Princeton professor Ethan Nadelman, described by Rolling Stone as the real drug czar, and the point man for drug policy reform, is widely regarded as the leading proponent of drug policy development in the United States and abroad. Nadelman confesses the aims of drug lobbying. Personally, when I talk about legalisation, I mean three things. The first is to make drugs such as marijuana, cocaine and heroin legal. Many lobbyists like Nadelman incessantly shout about the failure of the war on drugs. But either ignorantly or deliberately, they conceal the truth that if governments have fought this battle, it's with one hand tied behind their back. So what are the real lessons we can learn from the history of the war on drugs? In seeking to research this topic, the overwhelming theme that presents itself is the incessant pain and brokenness of humanity, most often brought about by the ravages of war and those who are always ready to take advantage. It's the reason illicit drugs have always been able to find abundant and fertile ground. <laughs> 
The war on drugs has not failed because in the long history of illicit drugs, governments have either explicitly or implicitly supported its trade or lacked the political will to apply sound policy.